If you've watched any of my previous videos, you know that my color scheme for my clothes, for my room, it's pretty boring. <laughs> I like blue, I like red, I like dark. <laughs> I, I don't know why. I think mainly because I don't have a good sense of color and I don't know what colors work well together. So when it comes to making a plot, it's all the harder to pick good colors that go well together. In today's episode of Code Club, I'm going to show you the strategy that I use to picking colors that work well in a variety of environments. Hey folks, I'm Pat Schloss, and this is Code Club. In each episode of Code Club, I use reproducible methods to apply them to an interesting biological question. The biological question or the question that I'm working with doesn't really matter because today we're going to talk about how we can change colors in a plot and how we can choose colors that work well together. Perhaps you've run the colors function in R and seen the hundreds of different named colors there are. Things like thistle. <laughs> what color is that? Much less thistle five, right? I don't know. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a um, online tool called Color Brewer to help us to pick a set of colors that will work well in our figures. If you recall the past couple of episodes, I put in a few colors. I think it was like black, red, blue, green. Um, again, primary colors. I don't know anything about color, <laughs> but I know that those colors are bad in part because red and green do not work well together. A good fraction of men cannot differentiate between red and green. And so if you're giving a seminar and you're using red and green to highlight different treatment groups, know um, that if there's say 50, 50 people in your audience, that the odds are good that you'll have a few people that can't see the difference between those colors. And so that makes it all the more a good reason to pick colors that we can use to discriminate between your treatment groups that you know are accompanying or um, accommodating the largest number of people in your audience. Along the way, we'll see a reproducible approach that we can take to make sure that our colors are consistent across figures so that we have kind of consistent branding, if you will, within our own manuscript. I'll show you uh, Color Brewer, which is really good for picking color palettes that keep in mind things like um, red-green color deficiency. And I'll also show you another color palette that I'm a fan of um, for a little bit more whimsical from the Wes Anderson color palette package uh, as, a, as an alternative to see what other kind of color palettes are out there. All right, let's go ahead to our project. Uh, and I'm gonna, for now, open up my figures, my PDF files, um, and show you what we've got so far. Um, this first one, where we are looking at the number of ASVs per RN copy, um, is black with <laughs> that blue line. Um, and so that doesn't have any color that I need to worry about. Um, over here, uh, for our rock curve, that's the supplemental figure one. And then this, our lumping and splitting, which will be figure two, I think. Uh, again, we have black, blue, green, red. Uh, those are not ideal colors. Um, and so but I have the same color scheme in both plots because again, I've got the same four regions and I want someone to know that this black in figure one or uh, figure two rather is the same black that's in supplemental figure one. Okay, good. Uh, so that's our task today is to find good colors that we can put into um, these figures. Let's go over to our browser and a website I wanna share with you is called colorbrewer2.org. Um, it's designed, I, I believe, for cartographers, people that make plot, make maps. Um, but I find it also, also useful for picking color schemes that go well together, as well as satisfy a certain set of criteria. So we have, we have four uh, groups, uh, data classes. So I'm going to go ahead and change that to four. And you'll see that there's sequential. So this is kind of like heat map, right? Where you have like low value uh, in this lighter color to high value in this darker color. There's diverging, uh, which is kind of the same, but going in opposite directions. Um, and then there's qualitative, which is the one that I'm gonna work with. Um, and so you can see that we've got four qualitative different colors um, for my four different classes. Uh, the other thing then we see here are that there are eight different color schemes that we could choose um, that would allow us to have four qualitative data classes. Um, down here, uh, this four class accent, um, it, that is the name of that class, I believe. Um, and so this one is dark too. Um, and, and there's a variety of these different palettes. There's the hexadecimal code here that we could use in place of named colors like black, blue, red, green. I'll show you how we can do that. The other thing I like about this site 
is that you can have it show you only those palettes that are colorblind safe. And so that narrows it down pretty quickly uh, to this four class paired, um, which doesn't give us a lot of choices. So thinking about it, what I might do is three classes and, and I'll add black as a fourth class. Um, so I don't like having two shades of blue there so much. I kind of like this dark, again, dark, <laughs> I don't know why, um, color palette. Um, and so this again is dark two, and it gives us those three um, hexadecimal codes. So I think I'm gonna work with this. Um, I like this and I like the confidence again that I'm picking a color palette that is accommodating of the most people in my audience and keeping in mind um, the, the sizable fraction of people, especially men, that can't, can't differentiate between red and green. Okay, so coming back to our studio, let me go to my code directory and I am going to go ahead and open up, um, let's do the lump split first. And so here you'll see I have black, blue, green, red. Um, something to know is that there actually is an R package called R Color Brewer that allows you to do the same types of processing that I did here on the website over in R. I personally find that this interface um, is just easier for me to work with. Um, I encourage you, if you're interested, to explore it a little bit further um, and check that out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and copy these codes. So this is hexadecimal. The first two digits, so there's a pound, and that tells R that that's hexadecimal. The first two characters are for the red color. Um, the second two are for the green color, and then the blue, so red, green, blue. Um, if, if this color were red, it would be FF0000. And if it were green, it'd be 00FF00. And if it was blue, it'd be 0000FF. And so again, these are hexadecimal codes to give you values between like zero red and full red. Um, and so I'm gonna replace blue with that, um, green with this, and then red with this. And then we will go ahead and I'm gonna come back and do make um, figures. And this was lump split.pdf. So I make files complaining at me. I'm not sure what that's about. Uh, we'll come back to that, but let's go ahead and open uh, figures, um, rockcurve.pdf, or not rock curve, sorry. Um, it's complaining about rockcurve.tiff. Um, let's do open figures, uh, lump split.pdf. And so we can then see if we zoom in here, our four different colors. Um, for V19, V34, V4, V45. Um, I think those those look okay uh, together. Um, something I want to try is what happened if we, instead of black, did um, a dark gray. So I think if we do like 999999, that should get a, give us a dark gray color that's not quite black. Um, eh, I think I'll go with the black. Um, again, some of this is a matter of personal preference um, and, and there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. It's again, personal preference. Uh, and I've got a pound sign before the black. It's complaining about, huh, simple things get hard. And so we see that's black and that looks good. I like having V19 V1, V9, V black, because that's kind of the reference for all the others, because that's kind of like the best case scenario. And so I, I, I feel like black is a, a reference. Um, to me, it signals reference. And then those other colors are other colors, right? Other, other levels. So that should be good. Um, I'm happy with that. And yeah, I think that, I think that looks pretty solid. Now I'd like to replicate that over in my, um, my uh, plot rock curve file, and maybe we'll figure out what that what it's complaining about there. Uh, so I'll put that in here, copy and paste that in, and then I will do make um, figures rock curve.pdf. And let me open up that. And so here we see those colors. Again, I think that looks pretty good. 
I'm happy with that. Um, again, the more categories you get, the harder it is to pick colors. I'm going to open up Atom and figure out what's going on with my make file. The error message I'm getting um, is overriding commands for target figures rock curve dot tiff. Um, so I must have that in there twice. So line 136, 140 of my make file. Do I have this in here twice? I do. Ah, ah I must have been doing some copying and pasting. Um, so let's make that TIFF. We'll save that and let that run again. Error message goes away. We're up to date. One thing I wanted to show you, I haven't been committing be with you because eh, it's boring. I've done it a bunch in previous episodes, is that when I run this R script, it automatically creates this file rplots.pdf. And what I'd like to do is remind you that we have this file called git ignore that we can use to tell Git to ignore certain things. So I'll say rplots.pdf. And now if I do git status, that's gone. But we have modified git ignore. So I'll do a git add.git ignore, git commit.m, and I'll say ignore our um, plots.pdf files. Okay, good. All right. And of course, we still have these other things that are a work in progress. So what we've done is not entirely, um, is, is what I frequently do, um, where we I copy and paste that color line over and over again, but it's not dry. And we've talked about dry in the past, which dry means don't repeat yourself. So if I wanna change my color scheme, I'd have to do that in both of these files. And that's not a huge deal, but um, it's, it's, you know, especially with these codes, it can be, it can be hard to detect differences. What I'd like to do with you is create a new R script um, that I will call, um, I'll save this and call this colors.r and we'll put it into, um, into code. And I'm going to take this line, or this command, the scale color manual, and I'm gonna paste it in here and I'm gonna make this a function. So I'm gonna call this custom uh, color scale, and it's going to be a function, and um, and what should happen is that if we save this and then source it, if we source colors.r in here, if I do source, um, let's do here, and then do um, code colors.r uh, uh, well, let's see. Maybe we need to run all this stuff too. I don't actually need that library knitter. Um, uh, I've got a plus sign at the end here, so that's not good. All right, so we'll save that. Now we should have everything uh, in good shape. That's nice. Um, and so now if I do um, down here, if I say color custom color scale, it, it adds that information. And I should be able to replace this scale color manual. So I'll comment this out. And instead, I'll put custom color manual. All right. So now if we run this, ah, I forgot to run everything else. <laughs> so let's see. Let's run everything else to regenerate this plot. This is the rock curve data. I uh, couldn't find function custom color manual. Ah, uh, custom color scale. Yeah, and that worked, right? Um, and again, now if I look at my, again, if I look at my uh, figure of the rock curve dot PDF, I see that it's got my colors. And I can then change my colors in that colors.r file and it'll update it there. Uh, so that's not such a gain if there's only one file that we're doing that on. I'll go ahead and remove this. And I will put that into my plot lump split.r. Uh, again, replacing this scale color manual. Put that in there. Uh, and I need up here to also do source 
quote code forward slash colors dot r. I'll save that. I'll save my plot rock curve dot r, and we're in good shape. So again, I could do make figures uh, lump split PDF, and then open figures lump split dot PDF, and it's got my colors. Great. So to show you how this would work. If I come back to colors and instead of black, I make this uh, red, I save that. I then make, uh, ah, I need to, it didn't do anything because I need to add that as a dependency, right? So I need to add uh, code forward slash colors dot R and then also add that down here. And so now if I do figures lump split, figures rock curve PDF, Oh, I forgot to do PDF. And then I can do open figures, uh, rock curve PDF, figures, lump split dot PDF. And you now see that that red line, that, that black line is now red. And again, I can update it in that one file and then it gets propagated across all my other scripts for building uh, these figures. Okay, so I wanna show you another color palette that is a bit whimsical, I'll say. And so if I Google search for R and um, Wes Anderson, this gets you to a GitHub repository for the Wes Anderson um, color palette package. Um, there's a similar one based on colors worn by Beyonce and various uh, photo shoots and whatnot. Uh, but these are color palettes inspired by uh, Wes Anderson movies. And so, um, Again, these aren't necessarily the best colors for being friendly towards folks with uh, red-green color deficiency, but um, I don't know, they allow you to personalize things a little bit uh, yourself. So I kind of like this Moonrise. I've never used this before, but um, why not give it a shot? It's got four colors. And so what I will do is we can install this package. Um, if you don't already have it installed uh, on your computer, um, and it's this repository has instructions on how to install it. Uh, so again, if I come to uh, our studio, I can do packages, Wes Anderson. Doesn't look like I have it installed. And then Wes Anderson, it will install this. And I can then, um, maybe in here, I can do library Wes Anderson in my colors.r and in my values, um, I'm not sure I want to totally get rid of this, but maybe I'll comment out that line and put in values. And then I can do, what did it say? Uh, Wes Anderson, where'd you go? Uh, let's do Moonrise 2. So if we do Wes Palette Moonrise 2, we can see, um, in our studio here, if I do Wes Anderson, Wes Palette, Moonrise 2, um, I have to do library Wes Anderson. And then if I do that palette, I get those four colors. Um, and so that is a Wes Palette, and we'll do Moonrise 2, put a comma there. And now if we redo our make on both of those files, And we can then again do our open figures rock PDF, figures um, lump split PDF. We again get our four different colors. Um, you know, those don't look so bad. Um, they're a little bit muted. Um, again, a lot of this is personal preference and what you think looks well. Uh, together in terms of composition. Um, and, and the nice thing about like the Wes Anderson, if you don't like Moonrise 2, um, that perhaps we could do, um, oh, what would be another one to try? Uh, let's try this uh, Chevalier 1. I'm not a big fan of Wes Anderson movies. They, I've always kind of found them a little bit tedious, but I kind of like the color palettes that they, they concocted here. So, um, and so here is that color palette. Maybe let me know what you think in the notes. 
uh, in the comments down below. What, what color palette do you like? Know that there's a lot of different art color palettes out there uh, that you can choose from. Um, have fun with it. There are color palettes that correspond to like team colors. Um, am I wearing my Cubs hat? Yeah. So you can get like Cubs blue and Cub, Cubs red, which is basically just the primary colors. Um, not, not very adventurous there. I'm probably going to scrap this and go back to um, uh, using the R Color Brewer uh, uh, colors here. That wasn't the one I wanted to delete, that one. Um, and so again, the nice thing about having this script, this colors.r script, is that I can update it and it will then update everything else. And so I can then put this back to black and we'll regenerate uh, those um, figures. And we can also then update our, um, make our submission manuscript.pdf because it'll trigger manuscript.pdf to regenerate because the figures are uh, prerequisites um, and, or yeah, prerequisites of building our manuscript file. So I will then do open submission manuscript.pdf. And if I come back down to the bottom, we see that I've got uh, my four colors and that all looks great. So one thing that caught my eye as we were scrolling back and looking at our figures is that I have RRN here in plain font, plain uh, font face. And operons are supposed to be italicized by convention, at least I think. Um, and so what I'd like to quickly do is show us, show you all how we can get RRN to be italicized. Um, and this is made possible by a package called ggtext. Um, and so if you uh, search for ggtext, um, see if you've got that installed. If not, go ahead and install it. Uh, ggtext. And that's installing. So what I'll then do is go back to my file of plot ESV rate. I don't know why it called it ESV rate. It's ASV rate, whatever. Um, and so what we can do is up here with our libraries, I'll do library ggtext. And what it allows you to do is to use Markdown to um, modify the labels in uh, your plots. And so around RRN, we can put a single star. And again, if I make that and I then uh, save that and I do make um, figures ES, esvrate.pdf, um, and then I open that here, once this is done running, um, you'll see that we have the stars around RRN, but what we need is with that GG text, you get a new element called element markdown, which we can then, uh, be sure you put a comma at the end of that strip text line. We can do axis.title.y equals element markdown. Let's save that. And then we will then uh, remake that and look at what it's done. And sure enough, RRN has been italicized. Uh, this element markdown is a game changer for those of us in microbiology because sometimes we'll have uh, values or labels on our x-axis or y-axis or wherever where we've got bacterial names that we need to italicize, but we don't perhaps need to italicize other things in um, the figure. And so that's really nice. So I again need to then update um, my manuscript and make sure that that gets integrated into the change uh, it changed the figure. And if we zoom in, we see that sure enough, the modified figure got integrated into our, our markdown document. So wasn't intending to cover that today, uh, but that caught my eye and wanted to be sure that we covered that before we move on to the next task. So the next task, what is that? <laughs> well, if you look at our figure legends, they're pretty, pretty Spartan, they're pretty minimalistic. And so we need to flesh those out. Um, and then I think we'll be in good shape with our figures and ready to move on with um, the rest of our manuscript and editing and writing abstract and then the uh, important section and, and then getting ready to get it off our desk and submit it. Anyway, I hope you found this discussion today of colors and how we can get different colors into our figures in R. Um, I felt, hope you found it useful. I hope you also consider uh, that this issue of red green color deficiency and that we need to do our best to pick colors um, other that, that aren't red and green. Red is fine, green is fine, just not together. Um, know that there's a lot of other color palettes out there. Um, we use the, our Color Brewer. We also saw the Wes Anderson 
There's another one for Beyonce. Uh, there's sport teams. There's one called Viridis. Um, all sorts of different color palettes. Aside from picking colors that stay away from red-green color deficiency problems, uh, it's largely a matter of personal preference. Another thing to keep in mind is that we really want to keep the number of variables or levels of our variable to a minimum. We saw that as we go up the number of uh, different classes that we need colors for, the options become more limited. Um, I've seen this a big be, be a big problem for people doing microbial ecology studies where they're trying to do these stacked bar plots with like 30 different colors and nobody can differentiate between 30 different colors. And so we need colors uh, that contrast with each other and to make that most effective, we really need to minimize the number of different uh, classes we have for each of our categorical variables. That's not always easy to do, but again, keep that in mind. All right, so again, I hope you found this useful. Thank you for spending your time with me today. Uh, please be sure to share this with your friends and, and get them thinking about colors. Get, get all of us thinking about um, what works and what doesn't work in our different visuals. I don't claim that these, these plots are the best thing ever, but I think they're pretty functional and they do a good job of showing the story that I'm trying to convey to uh, my reader. Anyway, keep practicing and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.